This is going to be, I think, a little bit different from the other talks. Hopefully it will not uh, bore everybody too much. I first wanted to actually say that uh, it, it is a real honor to be at this uh, at this colloquium in honor of Jean-Philippe. Uh, you know, Jean-Philippe, uh, actually, it's the first time I ever met him, though we have corresponded over the years, and uh, I've been a, uh, a an implicit student of his through, uh, through, through the research literature. And I think that he, in, in many ways, truly embodies a... Uh, a path not, I was going to want to say a road not taken, but a not road not yet taken in economics. In other words, a different perspective on the relationship between empirics and modeling. As you, uh, as most of you know, uh, economists tend to uh, prioritize certain types of theories and then, uh, and then uh, think about uh, data uh, relative to that, to, to that prioritization. There's, of course, a different vision which starts with facts and then tries to uh, theorize to understand why these facts might be, uh, might be ubiquitous or universal. So what I want to do in this talk, is, and this actually links to some of Jean-Philippe's work on wealth inequality and wealth dynamics, is I wanted to put on the table some, style, some, new, some new facts about intergenerational mobility, uh, which I think um, are, going, are, are in great need of theorizing and asking what sort of uh, form of models can generate them. And so what I want to put on the table, in other words, is a way to think about what theories of intergenerational mobility or the persistence of socioeconomic status across generations ought to, uh, ought to explain in order to be a successful theory. Now, in doing that, that's really a question that has to do with wealth. And so this is where there's a link to Jean-Philippe's work, uh, work on wealth dynamics. And what I mean by that is that in thinking about intergenerational mobility, the transmission of socioeconomic status, there's really two types of, well, there's many types of wealth, but there's two that I think uh, deserve prim uh, primacy in thinking in terms of theory and in terms of facts. One type of wealth is physical. In other words, it's the, uh, that's what Bequest would do. It's, the, uh, it's ownership of, uh, of the means of production, to use a phrase by uh, a distinguished economist of the 19th century. But the serious point, of course, is that there are tangible assets which are passed on across, uh, within families and across time. The other type of wealth, however, is human capital. In other words, the skills that are embodied in individuals that then have uh, consequences for labor markets. And so this paper is really going to talk about understanding some new facts about the, uh, the transmission over time of, uh, of, of human capital in, in, in the context of mobility. And you might say, well, this is going to have to do with more is different. It's going to have to do with another dimension to more, which is temporal. In other words, what the argument of the paper is going to be is that there is a richer conception temporally of the dynamics between parents and children. And once you see what these facts look like, that's going to require another type of more is different, which is looking at the interactions of families cross-sectionally. And so what I'm going to put on the table are a set of facts that I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm willing in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an all-out drag-out debate to defend as, as, as descriptions of American uh, inequalities. And then I'm going to give you some conjectures on the sorts of theoretical structures that would generate this type of phenomena. And so this is actually going to be, this is a, you know, a, a ink is wet paper. I want to mention my co-authors, uh, Yu Sung Cheng, Sung Hee Lee, and June Park, who are uh, uh, you know, world-class econometricians. And so much of the methodology in the paper is using some of the techniques that they've developed. So I think what I want to put on the table, and this is no surprise to anybody, you see that in newspapers, is public debates, which is that inequality is a fundamental problem in, West, in societies, you know, and certainly in advanced industrialized economies in the West, increases in inequality have, uh, have become you know, fundamental measures, uh, you know, issues in, in thinking. In France, of course, Thomas Piketty's work is, uh, is well known, as it is internationally. But what I want to say is that we actually have, uh, rel you know, we have a, we've had an explosion of, uh, of empirical studies of different dimensions of inequality without much attention to actually what the right statistics are for inequality. Like, what is the thing that you would like a theory to explain? So when I say something like that, that sounds kind of wild, but what I mean is the following, and that is that virtually all empirical work on, on intergenerational mobility comes down to scalar measures. You look at the correlation of a parent's lifetime income, average between, let's say, 18 and 60, with the child's incomes between 18 and 60. So you get a very simple statistic. You might be a little more sophisticated and write down a Markov chain where there's intervals for the incomes, and so that would give you, uh, uh, you know, basically a move from uh, looking at the correlation to the second largest eigenvalue. But I want to make an argument. There's actually something that has to be done that's different, which is to think about family influences and intergenerational mobility as 
explicit higher dimensional stochastic processes focusing on time. And so the thought experiment in this research is to say the following, and that is if we think about mobility, you want to think about, this is going to, you know, uh, the parents in the room are going to say, yeah, they know that. <laughs> and that is that you have a child that is part of a, of a household from ages 18 to 20 to make a concrete in this model. And what happens is every time period, however you, do, you measure time, there's family influences. Some of those influences are the income status of the families. Other influences are going to be the uh, educational status of the family, of the parents. Yet another influence is family structure. Another influence would be occupation. And so in this paper, which is going to focus on the interplay of income trajectories and, occupation, and, and, and family trajectories, there's a new w argument on the pit tape ground as to what it is you want to measure for mobility. And so really the concrete claim is that you want to think about if I have a population of adults, each of those adults is associated with a trajectory of childhood and adolescent experiences. It's the incomes of, that the parents had every year or every time period, and it's the family structure every time period. And what we want to do in measuring intergenerational mobility is, number one, we want to segregate those, or we want to create sets of trajectories that tell you whether or not it's likely to have success versus uh, lack thereof. So in other words, we want to, un if we're trying to uncover something about the dynamics of inequality intergenerationally in a society, what we have to do is have stochastic processes that respect the developmental process through birth, early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescence, and then identify what features of those trajectories one finds sensitivity of adult outcomes. That's going to be the, those are going to be the pressure points where you would like policy interventions in principle. But the other thing, of course, you'd like to know is something about resilience. Where can you have heterogeneity in those trajectories and yet have high probabilities of certain type of outcomes? So that's what the paper's trying to do. In other words, it's going to, take a, it's going to actually ask this measurement question. How do we make Moore's different? We're going to pull out the, the uh, we're going to you know, open up the accordion, so to speak, of, uh, of childhood and adolescence and ask what sort of trajectories predict what. So that's kind of the big picture in all this. To understand kind of what I mean when I say that there's actually a measurement issue, this is the regression that launched a thousand policy briefs and papers. And it literally is you find data sets in which you, the key stylized fact that theories try to address, policy recommendations try to address, is, is basically saying that there's some way to measure the, uh, the permanent income, the lifetime income of a parent, is a way to measure the lifetime income of a child, and you simply have a linear projection of one on the other. And so there's object beta, which uh, is, what you see on the front page of the New York Times is the intergenerational elasticity of income. And that's the object to talk about morally, much of the morally salient inequality in a society. And why do I emphasize morally salient? It's because children are obviously not responsible for the incomes of their parents. And so the inequalities that are induced by that, those are the easiest ones to make normative arguments. The claim in this paper is, again, it's going to be very simple, which is there's another way to model the process. And that is that in the outcomes of, of, in adulthood are going to be functions of three things. There's always going to be some scaling effect there that accounts for the state of technology or the economy. In other words, people are wealthier in 1960 than they were in 1860. But then there's going to be this idea that across childhood and adolescence, there's a trajectory F, and each peer value of that trajectory is having some weight attached to it, and you're going to integrate those up. That's going to give you the family input, and then there's going to be some additional unobserved heterogeneity that's going to exp express the limits of the theorizing, or at least the modeling. All right, so that's the whole thought experiment. Now, you may say, well, this looks trivial. But the point is that it's one thing to say there's something called beta, a coefficient. There's another thing to say that there's a, co there's a mobility curve called beta r, and then we want to know what the properties are of beta r. What is going to turn out is the case, and this is why I said here's a fact that we need, I need you guys to tell me how to model. And that is there's going to be a, a certain property that's going to emerge for the shape of this mobility curve, and that is inconsistent with conventional theories and economics of intergenerational mobility. But it is consistent with a model in which you think about the self-organization of families across the life course. And so what do I mean by that phrase, the self-organization of families? I basically mean who lives with who. So in other words, what I'm trying to tease you towards 
is one vision of intergenerational mobility is that you have isolated families. Those are the islands where there's no interaction. A parent makes an investment in a child. That determines a child's adult socioeconomic status, and so you can get you know, persistence that way. A different vision is that as children age, parents organize themselves on islands. They're called neighborhoods. They're called schools. And so the socioeconomic segregation in a society emerges across time. And what happens, in other words, is that as you go across the life course, the family-specific influences give ways to social influences. But the family income dynamics role is, deciding, is helping choose where the families are located. So is everybody with me kind of on a picture to have in one's head? You have a population of families. Early childhood, there's going to be family-specific influences on the children. As the, fam as, as, the, as the children age, the nature of the influences becomes more social. And so what then is going to happen is the families are organizing themselves. It's just a fancy way of saying they choose neighborhoods and schools subject to constraints. And then the outcomes for the children are determined by who their neighbors are, who they, who they interact with, what the political economy is, the, the, uh, you know, the uh, tax base of the relevant school district, who the role models are in the community, et cetera. And so that's the sort of model that one wants to have and I think is going to explain these stylized facts. All right. So why did I say that this is something I need your help with? And that is because the conventional theories of intergenerational mobility and, and dynamics actually don't seem to uh, give this answer. And the answer is that incomes in adolescence have a bigger influence on children in adulthood than incomes in early childhood. When I say that this, there's a paradox there, the, um, the literature on early childhood and on, or I'd say on child development actually emphasizes the plasticity of the brain and the sensitivity of young children to family influences. So this is a whole research program due to uh, Jim Heckman, the Nobel, who spent the last 20 years uh, you know, pioneering this. And there, the key vision is to basically take ideas from neuroscience, which is the plasticity of the brain is very high in early childhood. And so the inputs, the influences that occur, the family investments are particularly effective or have a, a fairly, you know, relatively high marginal effects. Now, from that vantage point, you say, well, if that's the case, then it's really the incomes in early childhood that ought to matter. But it, and this is what I said is somebody's going to come out of this and says we need a new model. And that is, in fact, it's the incomes in later childhood and in adolescence that are particularly predictive of the outcomes. And so what I'm putting on the table is that's the self-organization that, so to speak, that's going to be essential here. And it has to do with, I w a, if you'll forgive with a very little you, a universal property of societies, and that is se socioeconomic segregation. In other words, the tendency of the affluent to isolate themselves. And so when everybody's doing that sequentially, to end up with high degrees of spatial segregation by income and by race. Does that all make sense? All right. So the question then is, you know, how are we, we going to come up with a compelling estimate of this, of this mobility curve? How do I make a case to you that, in fact, in understanding the sensitivity of, of adults to their childhood experiences, there's an, there's an essential monotonicity in that the income every year has a greater effect the older you are? Now, this is the way you're gonna, you know, and, and that's actually a, a deep problem in the statistics of these models for the, uh, for the, for the base, most basic reason of all. We don't have good data on these things. It's not a matter that I have 150 million observations of parents and children where I can say I get to observe you for the first 30 years of your life, I get to observe your parents for the first, 30, or for the first 80 years of their lives and compare them. In other words, what we have are data sets which are longitudinal in the sense that you can actually observe parents and children over many decades, but there's going to be a relatively sparse number of observations, or a very a, a modest number of observations. And so where the frontier is in the relevant statistics is how can you come up with measures that are meaningful for these types of uh, mobility curves given those data limitations? And so what that's going to lead to is, uh, is the use of what's called functional data analytic methods. That's just a fancy way of saying that we're going to take the uh, in principle, this height, this, this continuous uh, uh, function, x of t, think of that as the trajectories of the parents' incomes and the parents' uh, family status. We're going to figure out some appropriate basis for the space they live in, and we're going to approximate it with a few terms of, the, of that basis. Now, what's going to drive all of this is something called functional principle components analysis, which is fancy jargon to say that if I have a bunch of individuals and there's variation across them, 
I can look for a low dimensional representation that captures as much of the variation as possible. Then I find a second piece that has as much variation as possible. I decompose the overall variation using these so-called principal components. And so where the frontier is in the statistics is there's actually a way to very efficiently estimate these, these underlying mobility curves. And once one does that, then we're going to discover something I think is interesting. So what are they going to be the, the empirical claims I want to put on the table? First empirical claim, as I said, is that if you look at the sensitivity of adult outcomes to the trajectories experienced in childhood and adolescence, there's an essential monotonicity. There's a certain sensitivity of adult uh, lifetime income to the income the parents had when they were born. There's another sensitivity at age one, another sensitivity at age two, but we're going to get this monotonic curve. So what a theory has to do is explain that monotonicity. Does it keep going up past the point where they've left home? Ah, that's when I said near monotonicity, it drops at age 18. Okay. So every, every, you know, remember Americans kick, we kick our kids out at 18. So <laughs> we're more likely to, to be precise. And so what is going to happen is it's going to go up at this and then you're going to get a dip at 18. All right. And so that one, that one, I, I don't need a theory for. I know the fact for that. The issue is why we have monotonicity through early childhood, and we actually have facts on the brain plasticity, which are inconsistent with that. So that's going to be the first, uh, first key picture. There's a huge implication. Please. But no, but that would be a claim that your income is the same at, 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 uh, at 25 as it is at 45. But this is particularly in the US, right? This is for the United States, and I'm looking at income trajectories. Yeah, so, I mean, let's say they have kids at 30, and we're talking about 45. If, well, okay, happen. again, I, I don't think I want to brag, but my salary tripled uh, in the first eight years of my life. And so <laughs> the serious point is that people are having children Think of, to be concrete about this and not be facetious, is if you have a child at 25 and you ask what the income is 25, that's quite different than at 20, uh, at what it's going to be at 40. All right, and in fact, what is going to be key here, this is, the, this is another way to state the fact. It turns out that, what it, that it's not just the average income that matters across the life course, it matters that it's increasing across the life course. That, by the way, is another paradox for conventional economic theory. Why do I say that? It has to do with the following idea. Again, this is, I'm trying to, you know, I'm now revealing, you know, kind of how economists think for better, for better or worse. And that is, I can't borrow perfectly against my future income. So if I'm 25 and the fact is I'm going to receive a large salary increase when I'm 45, banks aren't going to say to me, fine, take a loan, invest in your kids today. Because there's moral hazard problems. You all know this. There's limits to the ability to, to, to invest against future income. But that would suggest that there should be greater sensitivity of the child outcomes to the income in early childhood than later childhood, because the early ones are the ones that are credit constrained. We're finding the exact opposite, and that is it's the period in which the parents have higher incomes later in life that on the margin you're getting these bigger effects. And that's why I'm emphasizing that it actually said that we need a model that is social. It's one that integrates the more complex, the, I call it the more is different temporally. In other words, there's actually these stages of development, which are influenced this year, this year, this year, and this year, along with the fact that as the families are evolving, or as the, as the children uh, are aging, the families are changing the degrees of uh, the neighborhoods and things that they live in. And so again, another fact is that you see increasing segregation of ch children as they become adolescents. No, I'm saying as a factual matter, as children, as people get older, you will see more segregation of the of the background. If we imagine the Trump pay bracket, I find it hard to believe that this sort of sociological community values education in the same way as the upper middle class. Well, but, but I, I'm not sure. No, but, I, but I'm doing this for the, what's called the panel study of income dynamics. There's no trumps in that. If you're asking for the entire distribution of the U.S., you, the way you would think about that slightly different is you would truncate the very upper tail because that's, was, that's completely dominated by physical, uh, by physical wealth. I'm talking about the, let's say, the, the bottom 95% of the population. 
Okay. Are you still making this assumption that that holds true? That the richer you are, the more interested you are in investing in the job? No, that's not what I said. I said something different. I said that you may invest more the richer you are, up to some threshold. That doesn't mean I'm more interested. That's a different thing. Okay, and so if you ask as a regularity about the, the, the investments, again, you would find that that's an, that's an empirically appropriate statement. You have quite a little bit moving to areas with good schools, with better schools. Well, you did. I'm teasing you. Anybody who lives in Palo Alto, or, uh, that's exactly the perfect example. No, I left Cambridge, Massachusetts, to have much better schools. Cambridge public and Cambridge. Well, some sacrifices for science. But again, the, seri the serious point is that individuals over the life course are paying, you know, you buy, you, buy, you buy neighborhoods. In other words, in the U.S., what is housing prices combined with zoning segregate families. Can I, um, yeah. here? I, I guess it seems like we're having a lot of discussion about how one would understand the existence of the correlation that you're going to show us. Yes. Maybe you should show us the correlation. All right. Well, I, I'm sorry. That, I, I, that, we should stop. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. That sounds like a, that's as friendly an amendment as we're going to get. So here's what I'm going to I'm going to claim. Okay. Num okay. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. What, what is the issue? No, there is no issue. Okay. Uh, so here here are the facts. Number one, if you look at these the, the mobility curve up to age 18, it's essentially monotonically increasing. So that actually says something, it's, as I said, it's paradoxical both from the perspective of plasticity, it's paradoxical from the fact that credit constraints are weakening as you get older. In other words, your capacity to borrow is different. The second implication of that is that, uh, interestingly, it says that if you wanted to predict success in children, it's not just the average level of the incomes, it's whether the families are on positive or negative trajectories. And so that is a hint also about the way that parents facilitate the formation of aspirations in their offspring. Again, that's a conjecture. I'm not saying the data say that. I'm saying it says this is the sort of path you would take there. Okay. The second comment is it turns out that you can identify nonlinearities in this process that have a particular structure to them. And what I mean by that is that the nonlinearities are going to say the following, and that is that the income at one age interacts with the income at another age. And it interacts in a very particular way. And that is if you look within early childhood, the cross partials in your matrix are negative. So in other words, the marginal eff efficacy of a dollar at age one is lower if there's an extra dollar at age two. In contrast, if you look between early childhood and later adolescence, you have large positive numbers. And so in, econ in econo jargon, that's the difference between what are called substitutes and complements. And so the finding of dynamic complementarity between stages of, uh, of, of incomes, between childhood and adolescence, that actually begins to give you ways, in principle, you can understand what it will be poverty traps. In other words, there's something about early childhood, if you have a low income, it means that even if you succeed later on, the partial products aren't necessarily going to be high because of these cross-partial effects. And so you get something a little bit different going on there. The third thing that we find is that family structure is playing a distinct influence here. In other words, that if I wanted to predict adult socioeconomic success or failure, I need to know family structure as well. This, again, it's not a surprise, but it's measurable in the data. And in particular, divorce in middle e teen years is very damaging to expected future income for reasons that uh, one, can, one can intuit. Final thing that is surprising, however, is that it turns out that income and family structure exhibit substitutability. In other words, the way to buttress a child against the divorce is if the parents are affluent. And so what's happening, in other words, is the breakdown of families and po of poor families that's creating a comp an implicit interaction between them, and that's where you get trapping. Final thing to say is that if you study the occupational uh, outcomes of children or the educational outcomes, it does exactly the same thing. In other words, in terms of identifying the stylized fact to explain, you have exactly the same patterns for adult income, ad adult occupational attainment, and adult educational attainment. They're all being driven by these similar trajectories. So to answer your question, what is the fact? Okay. So the methodology essentially is going to do the following. Let me uh, skip all of those and say, say this. 
What we're going to do is we're going to take something called the, uh, the Carhoon Love Expansion. That's a very fancy way to say the following. And that is, I have this, this random function x. Everybody with me? That was going to be the trajectories of the incomes and the trajectories of family structure. The function is going to have a variance covariance structure to it. You calculate the eigenfunctions of that variance covariance structure and the associated eigenvalues, and that's how I'm going to decompose these things. In other words, that's going to be the cannibal decomposition. And the reason to do it that way is that if you do, the, do it with this way, most of the variation, as it were, is explained by the eigenfunction associated with the largest eigenvalue. The second largest amount of the variation is the second largest eigenvalue. And so what you have is as efficient as possible finite sample approximations of the underlying higher dimensional object. That's point number one. And point number two, even if you approximate, the estimates are all unbiased. That just is a fancy way of saying that the orthogonality of the decomposition means when you leave stuff out, it doesn't bias the estimates of everything else. So that's going to be what goes on in the techniques. Much of the paper is demonstrating that this thing has, is, that this is the optimal procedure for analyzing the data, and it says non-asymptotic, which is a, a very awkward way to say finite sample. In other words, this isn't just true asymptotically, it's optimal, it's true in, in finite sample. So you do all of that, and there's going to be a set of arguments, uh, which I'm going to skip, which are the demonstration that this is a more precise way to uncover, uncover inequality dynamics than conventional regression approaches. So that's stuff, that's the econometric theory. This is the thing I want, this is the payoff. And that is, this is the first fact. In other words, you go through the procedure I described, and you think about the, uh, the data as, as, as observations of an underlying continuous time stochastic process. You do the eigenvalue, eigenfunction decomposition, dot, 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 dot. You end up with an estimate of something, which is the mobility curve. And this is what I meant, that it's essentially um, increasing until age 18. And so the same curve is going to appear if it's for occupation, if it's for education, it's for income. And so if you ask the question, kind of what's the integral, the values there, you get the number 0.36, and that turns out to be very close to what the conventional estimate is. In other words, I just regressed the average of parental income, uh, the average of offspring income against the average of parental income, I get a number around 0.35. And so what's happening here, in other words, is it turns out that the conventional procedures were missing vital information, which is the timing of parental income as a first-order effect on mobility. All right? And so the second claim, and this is what I meant when I said the increasing income is more predictive, is that it's the adolescent incomes that seem to be predictive there. Now, on the conjecture, it's because the adolescent incomes are predictive of the quality of schools and the quality of, of neighborhoods. When I use the phrase quality of neighborhoods, what I mean by that is the levels of violence children are exposed to and the levels of environmental hazards. There's an extraordinary seg uh, spatial segregation in the United States of crime and lead exposure. And these have been demonstrated unsurprisingly to have first order effects on education. So this is, a, this is in log base 10 in your definition of beta? No, log E. So, that, so beta, when it's a constant, is the, just the elasticity in our jargon. 1% uh, change in parental income, what's the effect on the expected value of the, of the logarithm of a child? What is happening here is I now have this trajectory of incomes, and I'm getting the period by period implications. And so this is the monotonicity that I claim is the key stylized fact. All right. Now, there's lots of statistics you can do to measure that. I think this is the thing that's most interesting, which is to sort of say, what's, what's actually driving this? So the thought experiment's the following, and that is I have this thing called the offspring income. Everybody with me? And I'm thinking of it as a function of these underlying principal components. So there's three time-varying non-stochastic you know, uh, functions that each family is assigning a stochastic weight to. And so the data are well explained by these three, um, these three functional, uh, functional uh, principal components which are on the right. The first one looks like average lifetime income. In other words, there's something invariant about the parent that matters for children. That's the conventional theory. The second is that there's a component to the, uh, to the incomes of parents that essentially increase, has, a, has a shape that increases later in, li in life, and there's a third one where it goes down later in life, and what happens is there's special weights that go there, and so the second and third components essentially are what the conventional theories are missing. 
What the left-hand side does, it tells you what the individual factor weights are on those. So how this family is, is weighting this factor, this, that family, et cetera. But the upshot is, the key is that the conventional theories have just said, there's a, there's a scalar for you that explains your kids. Uh, that will explain 60% of the variation cross-sectionally in what's called the panel study of income dynamics, which is the conventional data set to study these things. The second one's gonna explain an extra 10, uh, nine and a half percent, the third six and a half percent. Does that make sense? Okay. The second thing that's gonna come out of this is there's gonna be a phenomenon that's called the Great Gatsby Curve. So here's another stylized fact that needs theorizing. And, that here's, and the fact is the following, and that is if you look across countries, countries that have higher degrees of cross-sectional inequality also have, lower degree, have higher degrees of persistence between parents and children. And so for mysterious reasons, it's called the Great Gatsby Curve. There's a positive association there. It turns out that for American data, there's a Gatsby Curve, another stylized fact about the sensitivity of, parent, of, income, of children to parental income and how unequal the incomes are. The more unequal the income is at an age, the more sensitive a, change in a, a $1 change is going to be in terms of influencing the kid. That's another segregation story. When incomes are very unequal, it really matters. I have some more so I can move to a better place. All right. Now, next thing that happens is the following, and that is, this is how you would sort of deliver on my claim, and that is that if I'm trying to predict whether families move up, they move down, they stay the same, the obvious thing to do is take the trajectories where families moved up, take the trajectories where they stay the same, take the trajectories where they move down, and compare them. And the key, key point is going to be when you do that, what is distinguishing upward mobility versus downward mobility is families that are, for the same average, exhibiting growth, exhibit upward mobility, same average, if they're going down over time, that's where you have the intergenerational declines. And so that was this idea that it seems that there's something about aspirations, et cetera, that's going to be influenced. Okay, does that all make sense? So now what do you have to do if you're gonna make this argument compelling? Is it going to have to deal with measurement error? This is actually back to the, it's a little bit of the question you asked before. As I said, there's a thing that's measured. It's called the income of the parents. How accurate is that? I mean, if you said, I mean, I'll ask everybody here. If I said, what is your income? You would have a very good idea about it, but there would be some, it probably wouldn't be exactly correct. Or would you have a heart attack if we told you? Well, it, because I would be so upset that it's so low, or I would be so horrified that, that Europeans are living so well. All right. All right, so the serious point is that you need to ask basically, how do we think about this object here? And this, by the way, goes back to the question, so what is, you know, why does income matter? Why would that be predictive? Of a, why would your income predict your child's? Well, a conventional theorization of that would be that you invest out of it, that somehow your budget constraint is affected by your income, so you buy more toys, you buy better computer programs, you buy a better school that they get to attend. The other thing, of course, is the, 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 um, that the income is, is a signal for something, something about you. In other words, you, you know, how educated you are. And so one would then go through a procedure asking, what if the income measures are not perfect measures of the, the object that's influencing the child? And if you go through that, what we find is virtually no change. In other words, there's procedures, in other words, in which you say that the actual incomes are the true signal plus some misspecification. If you purge the misspecification in the ways that we propose in the paper, you get exactly the same answers. All right. So well, then what I want to do, and I realize I'm running out of time and being very disorganized, and I apologize, is I want to give you the second set of stylized facts. And that is to ask the question, what happens if there's interactions between incomes at different ages? I've been talking in too linear a fashion. It may be a fancy linear because I allowed for this, uh, this functional variation in the coefficients. But nevertheless, we would think that there is a, there's a deeper underlying nonlinear system that's driving it. Well, you know, nonlinearity is, uh, you know, it's good. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to steal a line from Tolstoy, every linear model is the same, but all nonlinear models differ from one another. And so the art of doing empirical work is choosing, obviously, nonlinear models which are going to be rich enough to capture the phenomena that are of interest here, but on the other hand are parsimonious enough that you can actually say something that's precise. And so as it happens, here we're going to take the simplest form of nonlinearities, which is simply to allow for quadratic interactions. And so what that does is it produces this matrix gamma, 
which is going to be the interactions of the marginal sensi of the sensitivities of income at different ages. So what that does is it actually produces the following, and it's and I'm gonna, just a heat map. And so to understand how these are interacting at different ages, if you see red here, it means that that matrix is, pos is, is positive, and that's a cross partial. It's asking, how does the marginal sensitivity of, your in of the parent's income at age 15 change if you raise the income at age seven? And so the second one purges the ones that are, that where the, um, the uh, imprecision uh, is, is sufficiently high. And this gives the, the, this very specific pattern, and that is what I called the, the reds are the complementarity and the blues are the substitutability. So what it's saying is that within early childhood, contrary to the conventional theory, there's trade-offs. In other words, if you have more income at age one, that compensates for less income at age two. But what's key are these positive interactions between early childhood and later adolescence. And so that becomes the essential feature in the nonlinear system when you generalize the first model to capturing what it is that could be a poverty trap. And of course, there's another type of poverty trap which you mentioned, it's called an affluence trap. And that is that some children get locked in regardless of, the, uh, of, their, uh, of their personal talents. And I won't, I won't comment on any specific examples. All right, but the point is that this actually is how you begin to co construct theories that allow for certain interesting nonlinear phenomena, which is you have multiple steady states, as it were, or multiple invariant measures for families based on what initial incomes look like. So one can then go down this route again and, uh, and then ask the next question, which is how do you integrate families and structure and, uh, and, and family income? Well, again, you just do the same thing. In other words, you think about trajectories of family income, you think about trajectories of family structure, you build the system up, and then eventually you end up with objects that look pretty cumbersome here, but they actually have a lot of information in them. It's asking what the direct effect is of a, of a change in family status on the predictions of adult income, depending on the year the family status change occurs, how marginal changes in income affect the predictions of adult status, depending on the time when they occur. And then the third term is going to be the interaction of family structure and of, uh, of, of income. And so that's where we get these same results that tell us in terms of, about these patterns of complementarity and substitutability. And so with that sign, what I'm going to do is say, trust me, all of this applies to everything. Uh, and I want to go to the conclusions. The first point is the following, and that is the conventional way of thinking about behavior, intergenerational models is Markov, miss essential information. And what I call the more is different here is that we need to have a much richer conception of the thing called family influence that's either constraining children in terms of likelihood of success or facilitating children in terms of the likelihood of success. <laughs> the second thing is to say that in doing this modeling, it's not adequate to just look at income in isolation. That's a conventional statistic. I call it the, new, the first page of the New York Times statistic. You also have to look at the interaction with family structure. That is not a moral judgment about family structure. It's a factual statement. This shouldn't shock anybody, because obviously single parent families have less time. I mean, because certain constraints become different. And the, the, and the point is, it's not just a matter of making the observation, which is banal. It's saying the data themselves reveal it as having a powerful influence. The third comment is that there's actually an integrated picture here. And that is, if you're thinking about what determines income, there's going to be proximate determinants to that. And the two obvious ones are the education a child ha obtains and the occupation they have. And you have exactly the consistent features. And so this is why I started by giving you my conjectures. This is why I need your help. This is where the theory needs to go. And that is, the theories we have in intergenerational mobility, most of them are family-specific. You have some vision of the families making investments. There's another set of theories that are social, in which what the families do is they buy neighborhoods. And so uh, the neoclassical models of mobility by Gary Becker uh, are the ones about families. If I may toot my own horn, the models I've written in intergenerational mobility are all entirely social. You buy neighborhoods. The families have no influence outside of that. What needs to be melded together is a model in which you have across the life course, the emergence of social segregation. And so what you're having is as the children's age, the direct family influences are becoming attenuated. In contrast, the neighborhoods are becoming more important and who their peers are, what the tax bases are. Remember, the American system, a substantial amount of resources are determined at the school district level. And you want that self-organization to explain why you're getting the upward mobility. But admittedly, it's a conjecture, but I put it on the table. You guys know how to do these models. That's 
what I think is needed. So let me stop there and thank you.